Hello and welcome back. This is Pilgrim's Light Program, Episode 11. I'm Jason, the Director of Pilgrim's Light, and I'm also the pastor of Myers Road Baptist Church. Today we've got a few things going on in the program for you. We've got some Bible verses uh, that really uh, spoke to me this morning on my daily Bible reading, as well as an uh, interesting story about the founding of the state of Pennsylvania, uh, and uh, a few shout outs as well. Um, people that are working hard for uh, the country right now and supporting us in our freedom and our fight for freedom. And so stay tuned. We're going to get right to it right after I open us up with a word of prayer. If you'd like to pray with me, you're more than welcome to. Father in heaven, I just thank you for this time that we can come together. We can uh, go over your word. We can meet together, at least virtually online, and we can uh, benefit from each other uh, in your kingdom. And we just thank you for all that. In your name we pray, uh, Lord Jesus, to our Father in heaven. Amen. All right, we'll be right back. I just want to say that right off the top of the program, I'm really thankful for those of you who are watching. I know there are some faithful viewers out there. So uh, my shout out to you. I appreciate it. Uh, and hopefully uh, you've received some benefit through God and, and the Holy Spirit with all this and uh, really appreciate it. The other thing is, is that this morning, uh, whew, what a trying time this morning for myself. Uh, God really spoke to me this morning and through a few uh, verses. Those are going to be private, though, um, because that was him and me time, and I'm not going to share that. However, during that time, I did ask, uh, I did have a request that I asked of the Lord. I'm not going to tell you what the request is, but I would just uh, ask that you would join in prayer with me. You can call it an unspoken. Um, it has to do with the direction that uh, I'm going to be heading. <clears throat> and Basically, I kind of put a little bit of a fleece out there. So I'm just asking for some prayer, some prayer support on that. And if you felt feel led to, by the Holy Spirit to, to pray along those lines or even to take action along those lines, um, I, that would be fine. That would be great. Uh, I just thought I'd put it out there um, because... You know, that's that's what we're here to do. We're, we're here to support each other. Uh, hopefully I'm supporting uh, your walk with the Lord by giving some insight into Scripture and maybe even, you know, doing some things that you can emulate and follow along. And one of those things, one of those things, 10, 10 chapters a day. Now I know for a lot of people that's a lot. However, the benefits, the be if you think one chapter a day is good, if you think three chapters a day is good, if, if you think you know, 15 minute devotional per day is good. 10 chapters a day is warp speed, my friends, warp speed. Uh, so without any further gilding of the lily, so to speak, let's, uh, that's a weird phrase, right? Let's get right down to it. Now, the first, now the first um, verses that I was going over, very interesting, and it kind of ties in something that I I put together about the American flag. Um, and that, in fact, I'm probably going to work on that video here today. So once I get that one ready to roll out, uh, I'll let you guys know and I'll, and I'll set a premiere and, and, and I'll kind of promote that one a little bit. But I'm, I'm kind of excited about it. I, I finished the I finished the visuals uh, maybe a little bit ago. Uh, well, about a couple weeks ago now, I think. And it's just been sitting there waiting for me to finish it. So uh, this is kind of pushing me to do that. So what's the verses? What are the verses? The verses in Exodus 34, 6 through 7 are. Okay, so I'll preface this a little bit. Moses was given the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, and he brought those down from the mountain. He saw them worshiping the golden calf, and so he has to go back up. The Lord says, you know, I can start over with another people. Moses says, okay, well, if you start over, count me out, you know, I'll die with these people. Beautiful biblical picture of how uh, a Messiah figure steps in between the, the judgment of God and um, 
and says, well, if you're going to destroy this people, go ahead and destroy me along with them. God is unwilling to do that, of course. And so Moses goes up for another 40 days. He says, show me your glory. Moses says, show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. And this is 33 verses uh, 18 and 19. Um, The Lord says to Moses, but he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. And he's going to put him in the cleft of the rock and then he's going to cause his glory to go in front of Moses. And Moses uh, goes up to the mountain for another 40 days and he uh, is going to um, sit in the cleft of the rock. God is going to put his hand in front of his eyes. He's going to pass by him. And when he's passed by him, he takes his hand away and uh, and Moses gets to see the after effects of the, of the Lord. So today, today in the verses that I was reading, what's going on is that the Lord is now passing in front of Moses and he he says his name. And this is where the the 13 attributes of mercy come in. Uh, The the teaching here is that there are 13 attributes of God's mercy. And he says those because this is when he's being merciful. He's going to forgive the nation and reinstitute the the covenant and things are going to move forward. But he has to be merciful and gracious uh, in order to do that. So God's grace is always is always connected with with his covenant. We wouldn't be able to be in a covenant with God without his mercy and grace. And so these 13 attributes of mercy are are listed here. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him and he called upon the name of the Lord. Now this is verse 6. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means uh, leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. So to a thousand of generations, to those that uh, love him, but a short amount of time, a small amount of time to those who are against him. And... That's the graciousness of God, the 13 attributes. Now you might say, well, I I don't count 13. You have to count them this way. The Lord, the Lord, God, compassionate, gracious, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness. That's a preserver of loving kindness, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Those are the three types. Those are that's everything. Uh, iniquity, transgression, and, and sin are the th- three categories of, of sin. Um, pesha, avon, and chata. Those are the three uh, types of sin, and they are transgressions, willful rebellion, uh, crimes of passion, and mistakes, misdeeds. Uh, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity. Um, now the guilty in the NASB is in um, in italics, so it, it was supplied by the translation for understanding. But what this really means is visiting the iniquity of the fathers uh, on the children, on the grandchildren, the third and fourth generation. That means that he um, he forgives, and even those who transgress transgress or sin or rebel, he will work it out over their generations so that he will bring them back. Right, he he makes clean. He 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 preserves. Uh, so those that love him for a thousand, for a thousands, or thousands of years, thousands of generations. But for those who work against him, uh, he only goes a short time, and during that time, it lessens and lessens until it's finally finally gone. Gone. And compassionate, gracious, kind. And I, and and the way that the reason why that's hit me is because, you know, there's a lot of us in the nation who have gone astray of God's commandments and God's words, and 
and we've just gone away. However, if we return, if we ask for forgiveness, if we send the mediator back up to to plead on our behalf, God is more than willing and able to to forgive us and and to restore us and to bring us back into agreement. That's a covenant. A covenant is agreement. Now, what are the parallels between Israel in the Old Testament and the United States of America today? It's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. However, uh, as as you've seen and with some of the previous episodes, when I bring up you know, the people that have followed after the Lord, the things that Congress did, the, the prayers that were set forth at the beginning of the nation. And today, when I talk about uh, one of the first flags uh, that we ever... Um, that we ever used in this nation, you're going to see that everything has been steeped from the beginning with, with an agreement with God to establish us as a nation and preserve us as a nation. And so just because we've gone astray does not mean that if we turn back, he will not be gracious and compassionate to us um, as he was with Israel when they broke the commandments, the, in fact, the very first one, I am the Lord your God. And then the next one is you shall have, uh, you shall make, not make for yourself a, a graven image, right? Idolatry. And that's the one, that, that's the very first one, the one that leads to the rest that, that was broken. And it wasn't, and Moses hadn't even come down off, off Mount Sinai yet. But God is still willing to forgive, still willing to be gracious and compassionate and, and merciful. And that's because he's God and <laughs> he's not a man because most most worldly powers would not do that. If, if a nation broke covenant with another nation, uh, I mean, that's what leads to wars, does not lead, lead to peace. But God is going to teach the nations how to do this. Because he can do it, right? He does. He did it with Israel. He can do it with us. He can do it with anyone. Us individually, us as a people group, families, whatever grouping you would like. Next, I was in a... Now, I've got the 10 chapters that I go through. Those are listed. I'm on day 83. Um, I've, I've got a listing of, of all the chapters so that I can kind of keep on track. Not that I have to. I'm a little bit more strict with it. If you listen to um, Dr. Horner, he's he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm not really constrained. Sometimes I do 10, sometimes I do five. Sometimes, Exactly. I mean, as long as you're reading it, it's good. It's good. Uh, the 10 chapters is, is what I'm putting on myself because that's, well, because of the benefits and because of what I want to do. So Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. <laughs> and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And then it goes in, while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Doesn't that pair well with chapter, chapter 34 of Exodus? Paul is talking about God's mercy and his grace, even to those who were ungodly. He died for the ungodly, the rebellious, in their rebellion. And that's part of the gospel that is so... God's character doesn't change from the first covenant to the second covenant, from the old covenant to the new covenant. It doesn't change. He's always gracious. He's always merciful. He's always compassionate. He sent the Lord into the world, right? He sent him into the world knowing he was going to be rejected knowing that he was going to face trouble and trial and tribulation. And so this is what this is what I'm learning right now. But Paul, right, exalted in our, in his tribulation. And why did he exalt? Because it was fun going through it. I can I can attest 
that perseverance is not easy. <laughs> it, it, it's a it's it's a gut punch. You, you're hanging on by your nails sometimes. However, tribulation brings about perseverance. So if, I'm learning that if I want to persevere, that I must experience tribulation. And tribulation just means a narrowing, uh, a, a tightening. You're in a tight spot, and 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 everything seems to be closing in around you. This is this is tribulation, and seeing that tribulation and experiencing it is is not easy. However, um, the the unflappable, the unbreakable spirit, kind of like this just popped into my head. The movie Unbroken. Uh, that uh, was directed by An Angelina Jolie about about the man who was uh, I'm, his mind is escaping me at the moment. Uh, Frank Payne, I think, is his name. Anyway, is it that it? Anyway, he had an un a spirit that would not give up, even even through tremendous tribulation. And God used him greatly uh, when he returned to him after he got back from the prison camp, from the Japanese prison camp, Unbroken. It's it's an excellent movie uh, to watch for sure. And the second one I think is even better than the first. And I don't really say that about sequels, but it talks about what happens after he came back. But the whole point of that is, is that this, not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. Tribulation brings perseverance. So for me, focusing on perseverance, I have asked for the tribulation. <laughs> you might think that's a stupid thing to do. It is counterintuitive. But perseverance brings about proven character. And, and so character, right? Proven character. Will that one give up? Will they stop? But once you have the proven character, then you can be sure of that hope and the hope that an eternal hope that does not disappoint. Right? So that's the formula. Tribulation, so that you can learn to persevere. Perseverance, so that you can prove the character. And with that proven character, then you are assured of the hope of salvation. How do you know? Now, here's the thing. People, this leads into assurance of salvation a little bit here. How do you know that you're saved? You got to test it. You can say it, right? And, and you can believe it. But God doesn't work in the realm of theory. He works in the realm of facts, realities. And so the reality is, is that if you have never had your faith tested, it's not proven. And if it's not proven, you begin to doubt whether you are of the Lord because your spirit's telling you, how, how do we know? How, how do we know? Do we just grab onto a promise? Because there's people that say, you know, Lord, Lord, you know, didn't we prophesy in your name? Did, I mean, these seem to be like ministry leaders, spiritual leaders asking the Lord, don't you know me? I did many works in your name. And he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Well, what was what was what was wrong there? I mean, this this should go through our mind. The thing that was wrong there is they had a certain set of beliefs and they were doing certain things and they thought they thought that they were in a relationship with God. However, the reality was it was it wasn't the case. How can you be assured of the case? Tribulation, proven care, tri tribulation, perseverance, proven character, a hope, and a hope that does not disappoint. I don't say easy things, but I say things that I see in the Bible. You want to be assured of your faith? Test it. The stronger the test, the more assurance you gain. If you fall away, you'll know that you were never part of it.
That's out of John. All right. But I have much, much better hope from the from the people who watch the, the, uh, this program. <laughs> This is not a program that's going to be attractive to the world. I'll tell you that right now. And it, it won't be attractive to many believers. So there's another theme going on here, right? Paul, Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, he's talking about he's talking about preach the word, stay true to the calling, right? Be ready at all times. Why? Because there's going to be a time coming. Right? This is the famous part. There's a time coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will go after people who tell them what they want to hear. There's many people sitting in congregations and in churches because they're there to tell them what they want to hear. They're there to do a program that's going to they call it ministry, but it's more like um, you give us our your tithe and money, and we'll make sure that we got good programs. And this is the the tacit deal, you know, the implicit the implicit deal that many churches have, have bought into and many congregants have bought into. Uh, I'm going to give you my money, and I'm going to come to your congregation. However, um. I expect certain a certain level of service, a certain level of programming, and a, and a certain style of preaching and a certain type of worship. And if all of those things fall into place, then I'll then I'll stay there and I'll go there and I'll say I'll, I'll promote your organization, I'll, I'll give money, you know, and 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 these things. And I'm not saying that God doesn't work in the midst of this, but what I'm saying is on the fundamental level, right? This contract implied contract there is not biblical. And the reason not now you might be in a congregation and you go, well, you're attacking. Listen to me closely. I'm not attacking the congregation. I'm attacking the philosophy of ministry and the and the way people perceive how churches are supposed to act and how people are supposed to act. The popularity of a large church that offers lots of programs and has a wonderful music and according to the people there and and has teaching that people want to listen to and they and they want to hear. These these type of congregations are wide open for spiritual abuse in the sense that the people may stop going and may stop giving if the pastor and the congregation and the church starts teaching what's actually in the Bible. <laughs> well, I don't know if I like that, right? Now, there are mature believers that go to congregations and they, well, and and they, they go to these congregations and they say, well, I'm, I'm part of a, a church. It's, it's a good church. It, it teaches the Bible. Many of them give lip service to the Bible. Teaching the Bible, maybe on a very surface level. The church, churches I grew up in were more challenging than that. The churches I grew up in, you know, the highest ideal was to, well, it was to get into God's Word every day. It was to pray. It was to have a strong devotional life. It was fostering a, a personal relationship with the Lord. It was uh, attendance at services. Um, the emphasis was like, we're meeting Monday, we're meeting Sunday morning, we're meeting Sunday evening, we're meeting Wednesday evening, and nothing. We're everybody in the congregation. We're patterning our our lives about that. In this modern context, people, you might be able to get people to come to two times per week. And good luck in finding many qualified volunteers to share the load and the, and the burden. It, it, 
it's a, it's a far cry even and, and and what I'm talking about what I grew up with is a far cry from what it was before me where people literally you know walk through life together at the beginning of the country they left England together and moved their entire congregation to the new world <laughs> that's what was going on right the the nation was basically started you know with pilgrims and people of of different um congregations coming over here and transplanting from where they were to the to this new place where we could all worship the Lord. <laughs> so even three times a week is a, is a far cry from depending upon each other for our very lives, such as the pilgrims did, you know, in Massachusetts Bay Colony. Far cry, far cry. And in that and in that case, you know, the pastor has to be able to say God's word because the people will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths, things that are not true, that are not in the Bible, right? And the thing is, you can be reading the Bible and still not know the Bible. If you read 10 chapters a day, though, it's going to be far less likely for that to happen. So the reason I say all this is because we we find ourselves in in this type of situation, especially pastors and, and people in ministry who want to really do what the Bible says, who want to really implement it. I had one person say to me, if you're going to do a um, if you're going to do it right, have a have a church, if you're going to do it right, it's not going to be popular and not a lot of people are going to come. Well, over the past couple decades, I've found that to be true. Very small. <laughs> Nothing wrong with small. Most of the churches in Revelation were small. I mean, of the seven, right? The ones that were large were actually in worse spiritual danger. Sure, they had everything, but they were in very precarious spiritual danger. But you be sober in all things. In light of that, see, Paul's saying, and this probably was happening in the time of Timothy as well, you know, as things go out. From, from what the apostles are teaching, Timothy is like going to experience some of this because Paul's saying, Paul's not just speaking to Timothy, he's speaking through the ages. But he's, tell, he's telling Timothy, do not let up. Do not go down that path. Do not let that whole feedback mechanism be take you away from what you're supposed to do. But you be sober in all things. Endure hardship. What's the hardship? People turning away and listening to other things. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Paul says right there, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. Paul knew the Lord was going to take him. So these are the final words of a martyr. Shaul, Rav Shaul of Tarshish, Tarsus, yeah. Uh, Rav Shaul, that's a Rabbi Paul, a teacher Paul, Apostle Paul. Be sober in all things, enduring hardship. Didn't change much. He was probably writing this from Rome. That's why the fifth chapter of Romans and the fourth chapter of Timothy have some of the same themes going through there. But, one last thing. This one's probably going to be long. <laughs> it's going to be long. You have to watch it in parts. Psalm 83. Just new <clears throat> verses 1 and 2. Anybody tells you there's no such thing as conspiracy? Verse 3 of Psalm 83, and they make shrewd plans against your people and conspire together against your treasured ones. 
conspiracy right there. There's a conspiracy of evildoers against God's people, against his treasured ones. In the case of Psalm 83, of course, um, Israel at the time. However, in our day and age, it's anyone who names the name of the Lord. They come against God's people. And so this psalm, I prayed it this morning. And uh, if you'd like, you, you can pray it. But these two verses uh, lead off the psalm. O oh God, do not remain quiet. Do not be silent. And O oh God, do not be still. For behold, your enemies make an uproar. And those who hate you have exalted themselves. It's calling. It's rousing the Lord. You can just, as you pray this, and this incense goes up in the temple of God, right? And, and it starts ascending to the throne. Oh God, do not remain quiet. He starts to hear this. Do not be silent. Do not be still. He's like going, okay, my people are calling after me. And this whole thing is a call for them to act, right? Let them be ashamed and dismayed forever and let them be humiliated and perish that they may know that you alone, whose name is yod heh the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. There is a time. There is a time for evildoers to repent and to come back and to turn from their evil that they had planned, their conspiracies and everything else. However, if they don't, the Lord will act. He will come because he's most high over all the earth. That's the Bible for today. Trying to figure if I should do this next or this other. All right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do William Penn. William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania. That's why it's called Pennsylvania, because of William Penn. He was uh, alive from 1644 to 1718. So William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania, had been imprisoned in England more than three times for his faith as a Quaker, someone who had endured perse persecution and tribulation uh, because of his faith. While imprisoned in the Tower of London for eight months, he wrote the classic book, No Cross, No Crown, in which he states, No pain, no palm, no thorns, no throne, no gall, no glory, no cross, no crown. This is a reference to Jesus in, as his crucifixion. No pain, no palm, no thorns, no uh, no pain, no palm, no thorns, no throne, right? So he's got a crown of thorns, but he doesn't put on the crown of thorns. He doesn't get the throne of God. No gall, right? Vinegar mixed with wine, no glory, not no glorification, no cross, no eternal crown. In 1682, Penn established the Pennsylvania colony as a land of religious freedom, granting toleration to every denomination. He printed advertisements in six different languages and sent them across Europe. Soon Quakers, Mennonites, Lutherans, Dunkards, that's the Church of the Brethren, Amish, Moravians, Huguenot, that's French Protestants, Catholic, and Jews from England, Sweden, Wales, Germany, Scotland, Ireland, and Holland began arriving in his holy experiment. To emphasize his plan for Christians working together, he planned and named their city Pennsylvania, or I'm sorry, Philadelphia, which is Greek for city of brotherly love. His concept was that religion is not to be limited to a Sunday ceremonial ritual, but should be an integral aspect of everyday life, demonstrated by working with others. Pennsylvania is known as the Keystone State. It was instrumental. It was the state that held the rest of the colonies together in the way that it was the Keystone. And it's kind of the Keystone right now right? The things going on in Pennsylvania. It's the enemy is trying to remove the keystone. And the city of brotherly love is anything but a city of brotherly love at this moment. 
So we need to ask God to restore Philadelphia, to restore Pennsylvania, and to root out all of those who would do evil, right? So Texas, Texas took it to the Supreme Court, and it's charging that its rights, the rights of its citizens have been harmed because other states, Pennsylvania included, did not run their elections properly. And they didn't run them according to their own rules, to their own laws, and to their own statutes. They disobeyed the Constitution. They made up the rules, and they did whatever they wanted. And so Texas is now suing four states, and Pennsylvania included, in the Supreme Court. <laughs> huge, huge. Things are moving. God is moving. And we'll see what happens. So here's the last thing I wanted to bring up. This right here, I know the light's shining on here, and I've, I've made it so that it, it won't flicker back and forth. So this right here, this right here says, what is that you say? It's, a, it's an evergreen tree. This happens to be a redwood um, with the motto, an appeal to heaven over the top of it. What is this? So during the Revolutionary War, uh, we needed a flag, a military flag, to differentiate us from the British. And the the evergreen tree, well, they didn't have, they didn't know that they had redwoods, you know, in California at that time. But the evergreen tree was a symbol of freedom for the, for the northern colonies. And so they took this symbol of freedom, and they they put it on a white flag with this motto on, on the top that called an appeal to heaven. This is called the pine tree flag. And it was one of the first flags that was flown during uh, military combat in the Revolutionary War in order to in order to appeal. Now, an appeal to heaven, what are they appealing for? Fight with us, grant us our freedom, um, grant us pr our prosperity. We're appealing to the God of heaven to grant our request, which is a free, uh, a free United States. So this right here, if you want, if you want, you can adopt this, we can adopt this again, and appeal to heaven. That just shows you the, the foundation. Like I said, we were appealing to God in heaven, and, and the man on the street knew it. It was pervasive, right? I actually had this in mind a, a while ago, a few weeks ago, but I finally got the design I liked, and I actually put it up on my um, on my T Public site. So you can actually get you can actually get a, a, a T shirt with this on it. Anything else like that? Uh, I get a very small amount uh, of the money that goes toward that, um, but I don't have to print shirts. I don't have to do anything. Um, it's working through that that company. I get paid a little bit for doing the design and for sending people over to, to help that business out. If you want something like that, you can go in the um, description below. There's a link to where you can get that. But I didn't, I didn't do this to try and, and hawk this. I did this to show, <laughs> I did this to show what our nation is founded on. Another thing, right? One of the many, many things that the nation is founded on. Well, I'm gonna. It's probably been a long time. I don't. I should have a clock up here to see what my time is. Maybe that's in future episodes. But for now, I'm gonna cut this. Uh, I'm gonna cut this down. For now, I'm just gonna. I'm gonna stop. Uh, and say, you know, it's been wonderful being with you. Uh, today and in doing this episode. So thanks for watching. And uh, before I leave, of course, of course, uh, you want to stick around for the blessing, which is may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. That means guard and protect you. May he uh, make his face his, uh, to shine upon you. May he lift you up in his countenance, his presence. And uh, that means to exalt you, to lift you up and to give you peace. Yevarechacha Adonai v'yishmerecha. Ya'er Adonai p'navalecha v'hunecha. Yisa Adonai p'navalecha v'yisem lecha shalom. All right. We'll catch you next time.